Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don being joined today by Chris. Chris, I really like the people that are out there. Do you want to say hi to the good people? Hi to the good people. Yeah, there we go. Uh, uh, what we're going to do today on a Fork in Time, Chris and I were just talking off podcasting a little, little bit for this. There's no one else joining us today. This mm-hmm. is a Chris and Don show. So if you like that, stay tuned. If you don't, pick us back up next week. We get it. But uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. And I, we asked for this and we mention it all the time chris we really do like the suggestions that come from our listeners and many of the episodes that we've done have had their genesis in those suggestions you come to be part of the podcast as a result of a suggestion others that we've had on the podcast so this is this is wrapped into our a fork in time dna is this idea of listener participation uh, you've heard me say it so many times, you're probably sick of hearing it if you're a listener, the community that Alexis and I talked about from way back before there really was a community we were interacting much with. We knew there was a community out there. And so what we wanted to do today, uh, and Chris and I are going to try to do here in a good way, is look at a listener suggestion. We're going to engage that listener suggestion as a fork, but in discussing it, it has issues which make it tough to figure out as a fork. So the question that we were struggling with off podcast, and now we're going to struggle with on podcast is how to work through that scenario. Is that a fair way to describe Chris, what we just sort of talked about and what we're going to endeavor to try to do here? I think so. I think so. Okay. And so what I'm going to do as a starting point is I'm going to read the listener suggestion. And let me just say again, we love listeners suggestions i love receiving this suggestion this one was actually received somewhat recently uh we we encourage this so i i want to no way to this come across as being discouraging even though we're going to talk about what's challenging sometimes about when we work through a listener suggestion which all also by the way we did not do this here out of which may not be fair that's often why we'll often invite the person who made the suggestion to join the show they're going to be able to walk us through this far better than we are without it so let me just say that we didn't give that advantage here but i'm going to read this suggestion which comes from brendan kelly this came in in early august so a couple of months removed but i'm just going to read what it is and i'm going to ask you chris here uh, when we get to the point, I'm, I need to confirm. I don't want to mispronounce his name, but we're going to when we get to the name, you'll know what I'm talking about here. I, I think I know what it is. So this is literally copied and pasted. Control C, Control V from the from the suggestion coming in from the listener. So Brendan Kelly writes in late August: What if Hitler's family had immigrated to America? Scenario is in 1898. Is it Aloysius, Aloise Hitler? I've always heard it Alois. Aloise. Alois Hitler. So it's A-L-O-I-S Hitler. That's Hitler's father. His wife and his kids moved to the Lower East Side of New York City. Everything else in his life is pretty much the same. Failure in art school, military service in WW1, etc. He gets involved with the KKK and the Democratic Party in the 20s is a speaker at the 1924 Democratic Convention, very nationalistic, anti-Semitic, pro-segregation, a lot like a Huey Long, George Wallace, uh, Southern Democrat. This is not from the thing. I'm thinking it's in a Dixiecrat, you know, kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, um, Winds up in Congress, supports the bonus marchers in 1932, physically facing off against MacArthur and his troops, dot, 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 dot. So left for us to fill Mm -hmm. in the blanks here. And I had passed this on to the team saying, this is this is interesting. Uh, by the way, it's not going to get us out of World War II. We've inevitably discovered there's only one way to do that. I can't even remember how we actually managed to do it last time. But Chris has disavowed me of that thought. Softer side. Softer, Soft, uh, yeah. well, either like a softer side or a hard. Basically, Versailles picks whether it's going to be Yalta or Vienna. Yeah. So. 
it's interesting. The two things I want to say about this, and again, Brendan, thank you for sending in the suggestion. And if you disagree with anything we talk about, we we want to hear back from you as well. Um, <laughs> you ever seen the movie? Um, it's a it's a uh, Albert Brooks movie. And Albert Brooks is one of my favorite uh, guys, Chris Coppola. Uh, we have never talked about that, but it's uh, Defending Your Life. Have you ever seen Albert Brooks's Defending Your Life? No. Okay. Also has Meryl Streep in it. And if anybody disagrees that she's not one of the greatest film actresses of all time, we will have a fight about that. Meryl deserves those nominations that she's had. But there's a great scene in that. The whole concept is they've died and they've gone on to this place. But it's not quite what we would think of as heaven yet. What you have to do when you first arrive in the afterlife is you have to actually defend your life. Hence the title of the movie, Defending Your Life. And basically, you're put on trial. It's like a trial setting. And what they're trying to do is to see if you overcame fear in your life. This is the concept that's behind the scenes. And so they show you these scenes from your life. And you have to, you know, and the whole thing is, if you fail the test, it's, you know, a reincarnation motif. You're going to get sent back because you didn't quite overcome your fear. Otherwise, you're going to move on. Uh, Very poor poor summary there for a, a movie i strongly recommend it fun but there's this great scene in the movie because it's a comedy and it's albert brooks where they go to the hall of past lives and so one of the things you can do in the hall of past lives while you're there it's like a tourist attraction for the people that are there defending their life when they're not is they go there and you get to see who you were in one of your past lives and of course the concept is when everybody talks about being reincarnated or past life they're always somebody famous, right? Nobody's ever Joe Schmo in a past life. But the scene that's running through my head is there's a scene when um, um, basically the Meryl Streep character is uh, almost like she's a young Anne Frank kind of character that she sees herself as in a past life. And Albert Brooks sees himself as someone in tribal Africa running away from a lion and so uh, he asks over into the next Carol to the next booth, the Meryl Streep character, what does she see? And she's describing what this is. She's like some, you know, whatever. And she says, well, who are you? And he says, I'm dinner. Long story short mm-hmm. to say that when we talk about making changes in history, very often we want to do, as this listener suggested here, we take a figure like a Hitler or like a Napoleon and I remember in some of the early episodes, some of the first guests, one of the first guests we had was Brent Frost. So you often hear was reference Brent, who was on a number of shows. And Brent and I would often on some of those episodes talk about this great man theory of history versus the natural flow of history. And I think this suggestion plays into that in the sense of we say, what if Hitler's family had immigrated? And Chris, you did this uh, eight. 1898 was the date that the that the listener had suggested. You you looked it up or knew off the top of your head, did the quick math. How old is young Adolf at this point? Nine. Nine. And so he's alive. It wasn't the case of his family immigrating, and then he's born as a natural U.S. citizen. So he comes young enough to be young and old enough to be not an infant or just a toddler. He's, as you pointed out, Chris, the the Adolf Hitler in this listener scenario here carries with him probably most of his life some form of accent, even though he's mm-hmm. speaking English, because he's come at that period of time when, as he's learning English, he's already learned another language. I went way around the block there, got in Albert Brooks, got in Meryl Streep, got in a movie from, from back in the day. But to say that, again, nobody looks back into history and says, I'm going to change whose dinner. We all want to go back and change who the the relevant character is. So, Chris, do you have any thoughts about, you know, is it important that it's Hitler that changed here, or you know, is it could it be anybody? I guess is my point. If I'm if I'm making sense at all, you you are. The first the first reason that I picked up on the fact that he is an immigrant himself here. He is not born here is my mind immediately went to the fact that, wait, if he's not a naturalized American citizen, under the current legal framework, he could not be president. That's the first place my mind went was, 
keeping him out of the Oval Office. Um, and the more I look at this, the more I think about this, I do have to say that the listener brought up some really interesting points and some really important things that were going on. And knowing what I do about Hitler, I do feel like he could have had a significant effect on things as a non president, as as tapping into some of these currents that were existing in post war America. Yeah, and and so you know it's what I struggle with here, and I struggle mm-hmm. with it even though I would not always always voice it or enunciate it or develop it on an episode is the concept of a lot of what we do in a fork in time is the idea of the butterfly effect. You know, you change that small thing and the way that, you know, it permeates out over the ripples, you know, we use all types of metaphors, ripples, you know, currents, forks, all the things that we use that the title of the show is, is one of those metaphors, a fork. Um, but what we don't often articulate that's underneath every single episode that we ever do is the fact that we often talk about how that these would be big sweeping changes with the realization that, you know, changing that one thing may have changed so many other things. It doesn't matter, you know, kind of deal, or uh, we tend to do the other extreme, which is take the small thing and really just blow it out into something that is probably far bigger than it ever would have been. That's an easy thing to do. That's the part of the reason I thought this would be an interesting episode to do, looking at an actual listener suggestion. I know Brendan doesn't mind us using his because it's mm. a good one. And it's a recent one. But that's actually the challenge of even how we come up with show topics is that, you know, we will sometimes throw out something, and Alexis and I ran into this a lot in the early days of the show of, this is not a fork, this is just a detour, and we came back to the same road, or like a recording that we did here recently, in fact, it probably was the episode that's released before this one, in terms of how things will go out, we picked up on a second episode for something, because we had created so many ripples, and so many threads, and so many forks, like, we got to come back to this. And a third to come. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so I thought it would be a good, you know, a good exercise, if if not for our listeners, they may have already tuned out by now, but for us even, you know, sort of go through how do we do what we do here? And it's easy to think you've got a good topic because I've done this a lot of times and only come back to the team and realize that was a crappy topic, you know, that really didn't have a lot of legs or something that was small that was like, man, that was immensely inter- interesting. You know, we... Uh, we we discovered a lot when we almost killed Thomas Alva Edison with a badger. You know, we discovered all kinds of stuff when we did that. So I guess my question back to you, Chris, we didn't even talk about this off podcast. So this is all in real time. Where do you fall on the nature versus nurture thing? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I I think it's an interplay between the two of them. I think when we get into this, Hitler in the German nature developed into something different than I think the American nature would develop within him. But I do think that he's going to affect the American nature as well. So uh, it's that whole thing when you're when something's pushing on you directly, you're pushing back on it, right? So right. you're interacting with it, which is uh, which, which I think is an important thing. There, I really don't know a lot about Hitler's family history. So, uh, Chris, can you shed any any light on who the Hitlers were, other than the things that we sort of obviously know? So. Without there, there's a lot of conjecture about his, as I remember, his paternal grandmother. There's conjecture that she was a housekeeper in a wealthy Jewish family. So he, there's always that suggest. If anybody ever suggests to you that Hitler was Jewish 
that is generally where it comes from. There, there was a suggestion that his paternal grandmother, Aloise's mother, was a housekeeper in a wealthy Jewish family, and the patron of that house had an affair with her, and that is how Aloise came about. Aloise was a border agent, in effect. He was a customs agent for the Austrian Empire along the Austrian-Bavarian border. Um, it was relatively a respectable job, but it's not one that it's completely unheard of that he would have emigrated. Um, he died when Hitler was, I want to say, middle school age, leaving his wife and Hitler and other siblings, I want to say a couple of sisters, some of whom did actually emigrate to the United States. Um, I think that paints a decent picture for what we're talking about here. Yeah. So in this scenario, there were, I guess my point of that is there are family dynamics that it doesn't matter mm -hmm. whether this is happening in Europe or whether this is happening in New York City. The, the family has a dynamic from its mm -hmm. history that is separate from the bigger historical scope. Right. 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 And, 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 and I think it's another possibility that maybe not in the 1898 that suggested here, but a little bit further on when uh, Alois does pass away, Hitler's mother moves the family to New York when they don't have a breadwinner employed by the Austrian state, they do collect his pension and that and the opportunities in America may have been a better choice for them. So that may be how this happens. Right. And so in this, again, the, the listener's suggestion here is that um, Hitler and his family arrive Hitler at the age of nine mm -hmm. in, uh, in <laughs> lower East side, New York, which is just a piece of cake for every immigrant that's ever come here, right? I mean, it, it, it's a land flowing with absolute milk and honey, right, Chris? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, it, it certainly was, you know, the American dream, the American story, the story of so many of these, you know, both fictional and real that we know is the contribution of immigrants to this country and, you know, the opportunities that were afforded. Some you know, wildly succeed against all odds. Others don't. It's a hard place. You know, the the uh, laissez-faire is laissez-faire. <laughs> it works. It works both ways. And, you know, so one of the first things that popped into my head when I was reading this is thinking about um, he's not working yet. He's nine. Educationally, what's it going to be like for him mm -hmm. as as an immigrant? Probably has some familiarity with English, you know, but not not going to be as his first language, you know. So when the when the listener makes the suggestion, everything else is the same. That's an assumption. <laughs> but, Immediately, that's an assumption, right? Right. But I do I do think there's there are interesting analogs between this story and the actual history. One of the things, whenever. You know, whenever you hear th there, there's almost an entire industry of psychologists and historians analyzing where a dictator went wrong. Where did this start? Right. And most of them cut their teeth on the Hitler case at some point. Um, and what you hear a lot about is the effect of moving from provincial Austria to the city of Vienna and how cosmopolitan Vienna was at this point. And I think New York to this day is that only on a much broader level. So it's an analog on steroids, right? I, it, very much so. And, and one of the things that Hitler's racial mindset was, was a rejection of Vienna. To some extent, it was a rejection of this cosmopolitan, multilingual, multi-ethnic state, which was the Austrian 
empire in favor of the purer ethno-nationalist German state. And I think a lot of his ideas and opinions could have been formed in a New York of this time because he's exposed to almost this feeling of a Tower of Babel. And he is more drawn to maybe this understanding of a Anglo-Saxon Nordic America in response to this ethnic melting pot that's beginning to emerge on some of the eastern seaboard states. Right. And so again, I I think it it's interesting to think of the analogs, what's similar and what's mm-hmm. different, right? Um, and we, we could dwell on a lot of this, but you know, the first thing we get to is failure in art school. I don't really want to focus on that. I, I'm not a big believer in the if Hitler had only drawn better, we wouldn't have gotten to where we got to school of thought. There may be some validity to that, but that's not, you know. I, I will say definitively, as a potential art student, if he was alive. 80 years later, he would have used a Mac. <laughs> Gotten around that. that. Yeah. No, I'm, I'll bring it back to that every time. Okay. <laughs> but 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 the interesting thing that jumped out there immediately was military service in World War I. Mm-hmm. Because when I think of what, I think there were a lot of things that shaped the historical Hitler that we know. Yeah. There is no doubt that just like we've talked about this so many times, it's almost a meme on our own podcast. It's the um, World War One is the seminal event, if it's not the 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 most influential event. It's the seminal event, I think, of the 20th century because so much flows from it. We've talked about this before. I'm a big believer in the concept of World War One and World War Two are essentially extensions of the same conflict with some things that happened in the middle, and the rise of Hitler in Germany in the interwar years is definitely the result of things that we have. We can point you to so many episodes on this podcast and on the room where it happened of Versailles and the, the conclusion of World War I that the German dictator Hitler that we know is definitely a product of World War I in multiple ways. His personal participation in it to a degree, but also the the context that it placed him in, in his nation state after that. And the state his nation state was in and how it received what he had to say. Right. So given that, uh, I guess this is the term I'm going to use, I, American mm-hmm. Hitler. <laughs> participates in world war one in this fork is it the same experience for americans participating in the war as it is for for example the real hitler that participated Mm -hmm. on the other side during the war so i'm gonna go ahead and make my obscure reference to a john steinbeck novel a uh, novel named In Dubious Battle. And it, it, in one discussion of it, they're talking about American veterans of the First World War, some be coming back and being more pacifist, and some who are, in this case, like right wing, tub thumping, strike breakers, violent people. And what they say is the people who saw action, the people that were front line were not, don't come out of it jingoistic. The people that spent a couple of weeks in a training camp and then sat in France waiting for something to happen, those are the ones who look back on this as the greatest experience of their life. It brought everything together for them. And those are the ones who come back and are very jingoistic and very nationalistic, very violent, things like that. Um, This is one of those other debates that happens in this 
almost Hitler industry. But when you look at what he did, his service in World War I was as a runner. While there was danger involved in it, he slept in a bed every night. And when you hear that other description of these two types of veterans, it's very obvious which one of those he was, that he did not have this experience of sharing danger with his comrades and coming out of that feeling a connection to both them and the people on the other side doing the exact same thing he was. Right. Yeah. So almost because he's an American, I feel like he feels more. There are not only does he feel more like that, but there are more people like him that do feel like that because the, and we've talked about American involvement before, Assuming that he basically follows the same entry path into the service that he did in real time, he enlists immediately upon the United States declaration of war. If you look at the storied battles of the United States in the First World War, Bella Woods, things like that, Those are not even the army doing it. Those are the Marines because they were the force that we had available and ready to go when war was declared. So if he does follow what he did in his timeline, he volunteers, he goes through basic training in the United States. He is then sent over to Europe. And he probably doesn't hit France until 1918, August of 1918, after a lot of the heavy fighting has been almost over. So rather than living the soft life for four years, he's living it for a couple of months over there. And there's a lot more people like him that have that basic training experience without the jading experience of frontline service. I think that's, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So they are, they are veterans and not to take away from the Mm -hmm. fact that they are veterans, but they're veterans of a different thing than others who served in a different way. Right. Right. And served for a different period of time. And and, experienced different things when they did. Right. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, the accounts that I read, for example, of uh, British soldiers mm-hmm. during the war, French soldiers during the war, then uh, you know, Germans as well, uh, Austrians, you know, but both sides here. The the nature of trench warfare, the nature of bombardment, the nature of mm-hmm. what technology had brought to this war, you know, it was, well, we have a this not that this term didn't exist before, but shell shocked mm-hmm. is a. Is a very much in my mind a World War One term. My, the other thing that jumped into my head didn't jump into me, we're talking here is, you know, what other there were other American figures in real history that came out of the war. I'm sitting here going thinking about Truman. Mm-hmm. You know, Truman is very much a um, a persona that is formed because of his service during World War One. It was as a uh, in in our you know part of an artillery unit. Yes, it, it, it was it was very different than being in, you know, uh, being a frontline um, infantryman in a trench, you know, going over the top into no man's land kind of thing. You know, so while no one would ever doubt, in fact, it was a major part of who Truman was. If you've read McCullough's biography, for, for example, this, you know, this really brings that point home. Mm-hmm. It was the you, you, the difference. You, you mentioned Hitler being a runner in 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 the in the real timeline. You know Truman being an artillery officer versus being an infantryman made a difference. Yes, yes. And you know I can't help but think of that here. And again, I, I, I want to be very clear. And I've said this over and over again. So if I feel like I'm repeating myself, it's intentional. I think this is an excellent topic that the listener has suggested. It's just when you start dissecting mm-hmm. things like this, as we often do, it's okay, where do you go with this? Well, assumptions are being made that may be absolutely true. You know, the, the, the American Hitler coming back because of what you've just described, Chris, may be more willing to glorify war than one of those passive things because of the timing of getting there and, you know, getting in late and, 
you know, well, we helped win this thing, you know, kind of deal that went on there. But to just assume that it stays the same. No, it's not going to be the same. It may be similar, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be the same. Um, interwar years in the United States, because that's sort of what the next part of this gets into. Uh, there were a lot of ideological and political movements going on. You, you mm -hmm. could find some almost anybody could find something that they could latch on to, right? Yes. Yes. Whether that was legal or not. True. So we were talking a little bit about the, the listener suggests here uh, involvement in the KKK mm -hmm. and which there's no doubt uh, there is a racial pro pro segregation um, element to the KKK. That, mm -hmm. That's a piece of cake. Um, there was an anti-Semitic element to the KKK, but that was not the only the KKK was not known for just being anti-African-American. And was not just known for being anti-Semitic. They were also known for being, we talked about this off podcast, Chris, what? To put a very, to, to explicitly put a nice spin on it, for being for 100% American values, which explicitly meant, especially in their rise in the 1920s, being anti-immigrant, specifically anti-Catholic. Yeah, And, so and I think that anti-Catholicism helped really spread it outside of the American South. Correct. It's, you know, one of the first things that I started struggling with there was knowing that the, the KKK is not monolithic in its <laughs> it's an equal opportunity hater of a lot of stuff. Right. I mean, that's that's a sad way to put it, but that's true is that where does a he's got a little bit of an accent and he sounds a little bit funny uh you know in terms of how mm -hmm. it, maybe his english comes across because it you know it, we talked about it, he's nine you know how does and they're anti-immigrant mm -hmm. you know how does how does how does this how does the american hitler find his way into that group in an acceptance way right R right i I don't know if he finds his way into that group in particular, but I think he finds his way into very far right politics in a very similar vein. And he runs in these circles, S especially thinking about the way I kind of set up his exposure and rejection of a cosmopolitan city. I think he... Um, he very much played and and the clan very much played on not only this idea of immigrants, but we didn't explicitly talk about it, but the first Red Scare and this idea that these foreign political ideologies are invading the United States, these and and you have this very clear, easy way to look at what ha happened in the world, which is, listen, communism, Jewish Bolshevism brought down the Russian Empire. Jewish Bolshevism destroyed the German Empire. It brought down all of these empires. Now it's here, and it's trying to disrupt the purely Anglo-Saxon you know, even even in his our timeline, Hitler, he went back and forth as to how he felt about the United States, because at some point he was fairly admiring of it because he thought the United States was built by the pioneering and adventurous Nordic peoples. And then he would turn around and say, but yes, they intermingle with all these other groups and they don't keep themselves separated from these other groups. So I think very much in that way, you know, just that, that separation idea, he could have, he may have been a Catholic, but he was a, let's say he was a, a good Catholic. He was a good American he was the kind of Americans that didn't quite threaten the status quo. He wasn't Southern or Eastern European explicit too much. 
he was from a group that sounded and could look a little bit like Americans. So while it may not have been the clan itself, I think he can tap into a lot of these same ideas and whatever organization he winds up with would have a very similar membership list, I guess is one way of saying it. Right. So again, the listener suggested the KKK Mm -hmm. here. I don't think that's likely, but that doesn't mean he could not have found a group that to connect to that would have espoused similar things, just that would have been a better match for who he was and how he would have sounded, how Mm -hmm. he would have looked and how he would have played that out. And uh, there is no doubt that, you know, during that period of time, there were a lot, as you said, you know, an, an early version of a red scare you had the, you know this is the beginning at the same time of america having stepped onto the world stage as a power i mean that was mm-hmm. you know Wil- wilson wanted to be at the uh um um <laughs> yeah wanted East to be conference. at the table wanted mm-hmm. to be wanted to be the table at versailles you know and that was part of the reason why american american doughboys you know came across the pond was that, that was the that was the price of admission mm-hmm to Versailles and and Wilson had a vision for the world at the same time you have the early elements here of uh isolationism pacifism for all the these are these are at the same time competing things that are in the American ideological realm both of them because of the war just for different reasons right right and you know and, and the two parties are vying for which one is the party of of isolationism, which one is the party of peace, which one, you know, all the things that go with that. So again, the suggestion here is that he get gets connected with the Democrats. There's probably some validity to that. I can certainly see that. Uh, but it's not like that was the only place that he could have gotten connected to and still espouse these thoughts, depending on where it was. So I guess the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of um, if you had Again, American Hitler here. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's suggested here is that by the time we get to 32, now we're talking about the backdrop of the Depression. That's the cause of the bonus marchers is the fact Mm -hmm. that (laughs) the economy has gone south and I'm owed something. I need to go and get that now. I can't wait for it. Do you have any thoughts about whether this American version of Hitler falls into that or not? I think this is where he comes into his own. Um, I think just about all of us, either in our entry into being interested in alternative history or along the way, at least uh, have read Harry Turtle Dove and Timeline 191 and all of that. I really feel like at this point, a Hitler gets involved in the equivalent of the steel helmets. Okay. That he doesn't necessarily get involved in a KKK group, but he, but he finds a receptive audience in veterans organizations. And the reason I'm thinking about this is, you know, in our timeline, you did have the formation of the American Legion which did take very conservative um, views on things, but at least it was somewhat mainstreamed. I think in this case, this is where Hitler's oratory and his sense of stab in the back. In this case, it could be the sense that international finance got very rich selling weapons to both sides got us into this war and now refuses to share the profits of that with us, with the bonus army. So I think when you look at the actual bonus army, it was largely a one issue campaign. It was almost overnight. They decided to, it was a very distributed um, effort. It was not a nationally coordinated organization it was not a party it was nothing like that and i think that is where a american hitler could have changed this because he would could have come in and taken over that organization like he did the nazi party he was not a founder of it he came in got involved and turned it into his thing 
So I think you could see him getting involved in some form of American veterans organization and turning it into almost his own early Americanized essay. Yeah. You have thoughts? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can certainly see that. Again, it, you know, again, and again, not to mm. at all belittle the listener here or suggest that this mm. is, you know, there's there's more than one avenue to get to the same thing the listener has suggested. We often talk about that. And uh, I can easily imagine that. And, you know, one of the things that I don't think it translates well for us because the nature of the medium and the media mm-hmm. that we see it through, you know, when I see the portrayals of, um, Hitler speaking to these large groups and the hand gestures and all of that. Also, partly because I know that's Hitler and I know what I know that I already know coming from my, you know, looking back in history on it kind of thing. I look at that and I go, why was that so persuasive? What was it about that body language and that gesture and that style of speaking? Well, I don't speak German. (laughs) I I don't get, you know, all the things that are there that I don't think I can grasp in the same way that the audience that was grasping that is. But there's no doubt, you know, say what you will about the horrible things for why Hitler is Hitler, right? He was able to command an audience. And To to quote Lebowski, say what you will about the tenets of national socialism, at least it's an ethos. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And <laughs> and I can't help but think that whatever enabled that to be also finds mm-hmm. its finds its way into other things. If, if he was able to do it there mm-hmm. and theoretically, you know, whatever the American Legion, whatever the organization would be here that aligned with what his experience and his ideology would be in finding a a receptive audience, because the key there is finding an audience that wants to hear what you want to say and then being compelling in how you communicate it is I have no doubt whatsoever that that trend that translates mm-hmm. wherever it is, you know. Be it in uh, be it in Berlin or Nuremberg, or whether you know it translates to you know, pick a borough in New York. You know, however you want that to play out. Maybe not boroughs of New York, but outside, sure. I, yeah. I mean, think about there were in our timeline there were Nazi camps on Long Island. Yeah. And, 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 you know, so pulling all of that together, that leads me to actually to the one other thing that really is intriguing here, mm-hmm. which is, you know, we've talked about pulling Hitler out of Europe and pulling mm-hmm. him over to America. Well, you know, the first place that goes is, OK, if there's no hit, no right. Hitler, ergo, no dot, 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 fill in the blanks. Right. So I'm just going to ask you this, Chris, if there's no Hitler. There's probably somebody else who fills that void over there, right? Maybe not the exact same way, but Mm -hmm. the thing that allowed him to rise to power and to fill that vacuum, if he's not there to fill that vacuum, there's still a vacuum to be filled, right? 100%. 100%. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the other, I think one of the the interesting things about alternate timelines and forks is the assumption is, okay, again, this is back to, is it the personality or is it the flow of history thing that's going on here? So, we okay, if we get Hitler out of Germany... You know, mm-hmm. we, we 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 avoid this and we save this. Well, maybe, but probably not. There's an air of there's to me. There's an air of inevitability to a lot of the flow of history that the personalities matter, but it's the bigger sweeps that are actually what's being played there. I would be willing to say that the resultant Germany is revanchist is hyper-nationalist and is probably very conservative. The one unique aspect that I am not convinced would have translated is the anti-Semitism. And that's big. (laughs) Uh, And, you know... It's it's six million. It's six million plus victims. It's, big, right? it's how I'm American. It's how my family got here. <laughs> yeah. And, and so when you when you I don't want to say you dismiss that, but when you when you say that that's different, well, that, that matters. Mm-hmm. And 
again, I think, you know, part of the reason I wanted to go through this exercise, and I think we've, we've given it justice on all sides. Here. I'm, I'm pleased with what mm-hmm. we've done is this is what's hard mm-hmm. if you take. And again, a fork in time is a place that we do this for fun. Historians have a different way that they use this tool. They call it counterfactuals where they actually go in. In fact, I think I did an episode on what's mm-hmm. the difference between alternate history and, you know, counterfact. They're, they're, they're similar. They're the same thing, but they're, they're also not because what the historian is trying to do there in using this tool is better understand the, what did by looking at the, what didn't it's, it's a mm-hmm. different, it, it's, 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 um, it's an inverted way of doing what we do here. But it, it's still important because there are some things that have the feel of being inevitable, that have the feel of not being tied to individuals. But we do know that there are influential persons throughout history, and small things do make a big difference. And the question is, when do they make a difference and when do they not? And I and I, I don't say I struggle with that because you know, it doesn't keep me up late at night thinking about episodes that we're going to record very often, but sometimes I will look back on episodes and go, did we give that justice? Did we make that too easy or did we make that mm-hmm. too hard? And we never know the answer to that question because of what we do. Right, right. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this one, Chris? Brendan finishes his last sentence there. I actually had a hot take on it that I'm reconsidering. Okay. Okay. He he talks about during the 1932 bonus march, MacArthur facing off against a Hitler. And there's something similar that happens because in our timeline, uh, this did happen. Gen, uh, later, General Patton was one of the troops that responded, and he did have a confrontation with somebody who had served with him. And who had allegedly saved his life and was now a bonus army marcher. Um, my hot take on it was, I mean, thinking about this from a political perspective, MacArthur and Hitler are much more likely to wind up on the same side as confronting each other. Um, but then I thought about it for a second, and I think about what most people discuss when they talk about the night of the long knives, which was an internal purge that our timelines Hitler did of the street fighting essay in his rise. And once he was in charge, there was a good amount of tension between Hitler and what you could call the Vons. People that had a Vaughn in front of their name, people that whose grandfather had fought the French in 1870, whose father had been generals in the First World War, and who now had, you know, were generals themselves. Um, I'm really thinking again about uh, Turtle Dove and um, I'm trying to remember the the artillery commander. You you know what I'm talking about though whose, you know, grandfather had been famous in the, what, our our timeline, Civil War, and on and on. And there was a tension between kind of an upstart Corporal Hitler and these military, not just military professionals, but members of the military professional class. Right. Douglas MacArthur is as close as the United States has to ever that. come to a Prussian aristocrat. <laughs> so von, Mac- von MacArthur, so to speak. Right, so maybe there is some of that tension as well here. I I, I can see that um, and, and and acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because you know, then this is uh, this other thing of. Um, particularly thinking about MacArthur's participation during World War II, you know, MacArthur's the Pacific guy, right? Mm-hmm. And so here you have this thing of, you know, in, in a classic sense, uh, yes, obviously Germany and the United States were at war with each other, but, you know, MacArthur's main role in that war is is fighting the Japanese. 
And so, you know, Hitler and MacArthur never face off, so to speak, in World War II, in the sense of, you know, that aspect of things, the same way you might describe an Eisenhower facing but off with Hitler, for example. With the history of MacArthur's family, he very much kept talking, and I understand how wildly racist this is. He had an insight into or claimed to have an insight into the Asiatic mind. And if you look at what his father had done and his upbringing, that's almost like the French to a German. Those are the people who you had been fighting in, in, in a weird way. I, um, I'll think on that. <laughs> okay. On that, good stuff, Chris. I, again, I I want to say again, thank you mm. for Brendan for sending in a suggestion. Uh, it's a good suggestion, yeah. Which is why we we took it off the off the list and said let's address this. But I thought it was also a good chance for us to walk through sort of the way we when we are on our game, how we sort of construct and deconstruct an episode in terms of thinking things through and just you know what goes on, you know, extending beyond that. And and to just say. I've said several times here, I had hot takes and I had ideas and they changed when we when we dug into it. And, and I think, come on and, and talk to us about it, because I have ideas that change when when you think about it in a different way. And I think we all do. And I think participating in this discussion is an interesting way to clarify ideas and to yeah. develop them. Yeah, so, sometimes the uh, the clash. Mm -hmm. clarifies which is good i thought i was i thought i was quote unquote right mm -hmm. i still believe i'm quote unquote right because i've now tested again and oftentimes it's like now i need to take back and reconsider that kind of thing mm -hmm. and both of those are healthy to me that's the that's the reason i enjoy this intellectual exercise i enjoy it because i get to i got to meet chris and we get to you get to do this. I just mm -hmm. enjoy doing this. You don't get to do this, you know, in, in everyday conversation very often. So when we have a place that allows us to do this, and those of us that enjoy it, we presume that's why you listen to it. If you're a listener too, is you must enjoy it or you must be a, uh, you must be a masochist of some type, you know, one, one of the two or both. You could be both. Yeah. They're not, they're not mutually. Exclusive. Not that we're judging. Not that we are not at all, but you know, that's the reason I, I've mm -hmm. always enjoyed this exercise. It causes me to think. Mm -hmm. and, and that's mm -hmm. not a bad place to be. The other thing I'll do, again, you know, it feels like it's what I do every episode now, but I'll put in the plug for it. That's why I wanted to have initially when we started the podcast and why on the website, uh, a forum was part of what was there. The idea was there would be discussion around the topic. Well, the nature of a podcast, I've said this so many times, it's a one-way audio medium most of the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we do have ways that includes the feedback that you're able to give on the website or what we've done here in the last two months, which is set up a discussion place. The Discord forum is precisely for that purpose. Chris and I had a conversation here, which you may 100% agree with or you may 100% disagree with. We created a place to continue this conversation and continue to flesh it out. So if you liked what you heard here and you want to say, yep, I agree with you. There's a place to go and do that. If you want to say, Don, you're an idiot. How in the world did you miss that or not think of this? There's a place to go and do that. And both of those are equally welcome. I don't call Chris an idiot. Chris is not an idiot. Don can be an idiot. Chris isn't. But uh, but that's, you know, so if you haven't joined us there, and one of the cool things about that is it won't just be Chris and I talking. That's mm -hmm. where their community is forming there and a place for us to exchange things and 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 cool people. I've said this again. I will say it every chance I get. The reason I've enjoyed now 100, I think this will be the 165th episode of A Fork in Time. The reason I've enjoyed it is the conversations of the people that I've met along the way. The 60 plus solo episodes that I did where I was conjecturing about alternate history, just me talking into a microphone. That was fun for me. May have been fun for you as a listener, but it ain't the same exercise. Yeah. Anything else, Chris? Not not particularly. Okay. So I, I was going to close this out here saying that if you happen along a timeline where you've got an American Hitler and a European Hitler, consider both of the possibilities. Take the fork. <laughs> All right. Talk to you guys next time. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. 
Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash a fork in time or follow us on Twitter at A F I T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. We hope you will join us next time.